Welcome! In this episode of Zero to Autonomous, we are going to program a swerve drive chassis. First, we will drive it using joysticks for the teleoperated mode. After that, we'll drive it autonomously using a pre-planned path. Let's get started. Unlike tank drive robots we've used in the past, Swerve Drive offers a lot more freedom on how the robot can move. On each of the four Swerve modules, we have two brushless motors, one controlling how fast the wheel spins, the other controlling the direction of the wheel. With these special wheels, we can drive forward, sideways, and rotate in place. And of course, we can move around while spinning. One great way to control these actions on a gamepad is to let one joystick control moving around and the other control spinning. And notice, upwards on the joystick always means forward relative to the field, not to the robot's front side. This makes it easy to drive around while spinning. Now, let's plan out the workflow needed to drive a sort of chassis. So, we are given three numbers by the joysticks representing the driver's desired speed in the x, y, and turning directions relative to the field. First, we will convert that action into the robot's local reference frame. In other words, how the robot should move in its perspective. We'll get a new set of x, y, and turning speed values. And in the code, you'll see this referred to as the chassis speeds, since these three numbers completely describe an action for the chassis as a whole. Next, we want to find out what each sort of module should do in order to achieve this action for the whole chassis. By doing some geometry, we can calculate the exact speed and angle that each wheel should be at. These speeds and angles will be called sort of module states as they describe actions for each module to perform. The final step is to apply these actions to each module so that they actually achieve the speed and angle that is requested. The functions to convert reference frames and to calculate the module states are mostly done by the WPI library. However, we will need to do some work to apply the speed and angle to each wheel. So let's see how to do that. This function is the same for all four modules, so we'll just look at one of them. For the speed, we are given the value in meters per second, so we need to convert that value into a motor output percentage. There are a few ways to do this. If we know that our robot has a physical max speed of 5 meters per second, and that maps to 100% power on the motor, we can simply divide the incoming speed value by 5. For this robot, that works reasonably well. However, if you want more accuracy, you can look into more advanced feed forward controls or using a velocity PID controller. But for this video, we'll keep it simple by just dividing 5. For the angle, we can use a PID controller to drive the motor to the requested set point. However, there is one optimization we can do beforehand. Let's imagine our wheel is currently at 0 degrees, and it is told to go to 135 degrees. Now, it could go the long way, but if we spin it backwards and reverse the wheel's requested driving speed, we can get the same result faster. The optimized motion function finds these shortcuts, so the wheel actually never has to spin more than 90 degrees at a time. So that's it for the theory. Now let's talk about the code. Today, we are going to program our robot in the command-based structure. We will have one Swerve subsystem, which contains four Swerve modules. Then, we'll have two commands. One that drives the robot using joysticks in the teleoperated mode, and one that follows a trajectory in autonomous mode. Okay, so I've created an empty command based template in VS Code. First, let's create the swerve modules. Since we have four identical modules, we can create a class for them to reuse some code. 
On this robot, we have two Neo motors with a spark match motor controller. And we'll want to access the encoders that are built into the motors. We'll also have a PID controller to move the angle motor. Finally, we'll have an absolute encoder connected to the turning motor. This is because every time the robot powers off, the motor's encoders will lose their previous readings. But with the absolute encoders that permanently know their locations, the robot can always figure out where the wheels are facing. Absolute encoders are connected to the analog inputs on the robot wheel, so we can access them using the analog input class in our code. We'll have a variable to store whether it's reversed and its offset position. So, when you first assemble your robot, the absolute encoder reading might differ from the actual wheel angle. We can record how much it is off by in this variable and compensate for it later in the code. In the class constructor, we will ask for the port numbers of all the motors, sensors, and whether they are reversed. Then, we can initialize them with those settings. We'll create the absolute encoder, create the motors, get the motors encoders, set the encoder conversion constants so that we can work with meters and radians instead of rotations, and initialize the PID controller. I have already calculated the wheel diameter, gear ratio, and encoder constants for this robot, so I'll add them to constants.java under the module constants section. For the PID controller, the proportional term alone already does a good job of adjusting the wheel angle, so there's no need to mess with the integral and derivative term. We can also set the PID controller to be continuous at negative pi and pi radians. This tells the PID that our system is circular and that these two points are connected so it could jump through this gap. Next, let's add some helpful methods to get the encoder values. The first four are about the built-in encoders. To get the absolute encoder value, we'll need to divide its voltage reading by the voltage that we're supplying it. That gives us how many percent of a full rotation it is reading. We'll multiply 2 pi to convert it to radians, subtract the offset to get the actual wheel angles, and multiply negative 1 if it's reversed. So remember how the encoders in the motors will lose their readings every time the robot restarts? Let's create a function to give them the values of the absolute encoders, which always know their locations. In here, we can reset the drive motor encoder to 0, and the turning encoder to be the absolute encoder value. This way, the turning encoder's reading will be aligned with the wheel's actual angle. We'll call this function when the robot boots up. Great! We now can access all the encoder positions and velocities. However, a lot of the WPI library later on will request this info in the format of swerve module state. So we can create a method to return that as well. Finally, let's make the function that actuates this module. It will take in a swerve module state, which has a velocity request and angle request. First, we will optimize the angle setpoint, so we'll never have to move more than 90 degrees. Then, we'll scale the velocity down using the robot's max speed and set it to the drive motor. And we'll update constants.java as well. For the turning motor, we will use the PID controller to calculate the output for this angle setpoint and the current position. Finally, we can send out some debug information. At this point, the swerve module would work, but there's one small problem. Later on, when we are driving this robot with joysticks, as soon as we let go of the controls, the WPI library is going to reset the module states back to 0 degrees. And that is quite annoying when driving. To solve this problem, we can add an if statement in this function to check that if the new requested command has no substantial driving velocity, we can ignore this command, including its requested angle setpoint. Instead, we can stop the motors and exit the function. And that's it for this file. Next, let's make the Swerve subsystem using the four modules. We'll make a new file and extend subsystem base. First, 
we can create four Swerve modules using their respective port numbers and update constants.java. Then, we'll create a Navex gyroscope using the AHRS library. Now, we want to reset the gyroscope every time the robot boots up to have it set that direction as the forward direction of the field. And we can make a function to do that. However, we can't call this function in the constructor because the gyroscope will be busy recalibrating every time when it boots up. One workaround to this is to simply delay one second and then request it to reset the angle. And we can put it on another thread so it doesn't block the rest of our code from running. Great! Now let's make a function to get the robot heading from the gyroscope. By default, the gyroscope value is continuous, meaning it can go up to 360, 720 degrees, etc. To make it easier to use, we'll have this function clamp it within negative and positive 180 degrees. Because the WPI library will often want it in the format of rotation 2D, we can make a function for that as well. Finally, in the periodic function, we can monitor the robot heading value. As for the motors, we'll have a function to stop the modules and a function to set the modules. This function takes in an array of four module states and applies them all. However, one thing we need to add in here first is to normalize the wheel speeds. So imagine, if each wheel has a max speed of 5 meters per second, but we try to drive them over their limit, all of them are going to just tap at their max speed, and we lose control of the robot's steering. To solve this, we can proportionally decrease the wheel speeds until they are all achievable using this normalize function. And that's it for the subsystem. Now let's create a command to drive the robot using joysticks. Under the commands folder, let's create a new file and extend command base. In the constructor, we will ask for the swerve subsystem, the x, y turning joystick values in the format of suppliers, and a boolean supplier value to decide whether or not the user wants the joystick command to be field oriented. We will save all of them in some variables and require the subsystem. In execute, we will first get the latest values from the joysticks. Then, we will apply a deadband. So, if the joystick doesn't center back to exactly zero, we will ignore any small inputs to protect the motors. Now, we could use these joystick values, but one nice thing to add is a rate limiter. As the name suggests, if you push the joystick too violently, it will limit the acceleration to make the robot drive smoother. So, we will create them in the constructor and use them here. Now, our joystick values range from negative 1 to positive 1, but we want to convert it into meters per second and radians per second. However, instead of scaling them to the max speed, which would be way too fast to control, we'll scale them to a quarter of that with these new constants. Okay, we are done processing the joystick values. Let's convert the speeds to the appropriate reference frames. If the user wants to operate with respect to the field by giving true in the field-oriented function, we'll ask the WPI library to convert to the robot's local reference frame. It wants the X speed, Y speed, turning speed, and the current robot heading. If the user wants to drive with respect to the robot's forward direction, we will just construct a new chassis speed using the joystick speeds. Now that we have the chassis speeds, we want to get the command for each swerve module. But first, we need to specify the kinematics of our robot. In constants.java, we'll define the robot's track width and wheelbase. Then, we can create a swerve drive kinematics object specifying the locations of each swerve module on the robot. This way, the WPI library can construct the geometry of our robot setup and do all the calculations. Back in our command, we can use our object to generate an array of four swerve module states using our chassis speed. Finally, we'll set the module states to each wheel. And that's it for the execute function. In the end function, we can stop the motors. In is finished, we'll request that this command never ends unless interrupted.
Now let's go to robotcontainer.java. Here, we can create a Swerve subsystem instance and make the joystick object. We can set the Swerve joystick command to be the default command for the Swerve chassis. We'll give it the subsystem instance, three joystick axes, and the opposite value of a joystick button, so by default it will operate in the fields reference frame. In the configure button bindings function, we will let the second joystick button reset the robot's heading. You can use this to reset the direction of the fields reference frame. Note that this is a shorthand way to create a command. By putting a function in here, we have actually created an instant command that executes this line of code and it immediately finishes. That's it for the tally operated code. Let's drive it with a joystick. Okay, now let's talk about autonomous driving. Let's say we want the robot to drive this smooth path. To the robot, this curve is actually a sequence of commands. Each dot contains a different combination of X speed, Y speed, and turning speed, representing what the robot should do at that moment. So when it's driving this path, it's actually just rapidly firing the sequence of commands to the motors. And if we correctly work out all the speeds and accelerations beforehand, it should drive the path perfectly. So one of the main tasks in autonomous driving is to generate this sequence of commands. However, if we stop here, our robot won't be very accurate because the physics model is not 100% correct. And there may be other unforeseen disturbances. So wouldn't it be great if the robot itself can realize that it's off course and automatically correct itself back onto the path? To do that, the robot will first have to know where it is at. In other words, its coordinates on the field. To calculate that, we'll need an odometer. And here's how that works. Imagine our robot is at the point x0, y0 on the field. And then it drove forward a bit. Because we have a gyroscope and some encoders, we know it drove in this direction and traveled this distance. Then, by doing some geometry, we can figure out its new location. By doing this process 50 times a second, the odometer can accumulate small displacements and determine the robot's real-time location. Now that the robot can sense when it's off course, let's see how it can do something about it. Let's say the robot is supposed to be here in the middle of the trajectory, but with the odometer, it realizes it's actually over there. Now, we can calculate its error in the x direction, y direction, and in terms of heading. Based on these errors, we can use three PID controllers to push the robot more towards the correct position. Here, notice that the robot is still outputting the speeds from the trajectory. The PID outputs are just additional nudges to further help get where it's supposed to be. To introduce some control theory terms, these are called feedforward control because we are guessing how the robot should move based on the robot's physics. And the PIDs fall under feedback control, since they first measure the robot's response and then try to correct based on the error. Okay, let's look at the tele-operated code we already have. Basically, the code takes in an X speed Y speed and turning speed and drives the robot accordingly. Now, instead of using the joysticks, we are going to let the trajectory feedback and feed forward control take over the steering of the robot. And it needs the odometer, so we'll implement that as well. Now let's head over to the code. First, we'll add the odometer to the Swerve Drive subsystem. We can use the Swerve Drive odometry class from the WPI library, give it our Swerve Drive kinematics configurations, and the current gyroscope angle. In the periodic function, we will repeatedly update the odometer for it to accumulate our location. 
and we will provide it with the current robot heading and the states of all four source modules. Next, we can create a function to get the location determined by the odometer and a function to reset the odometer to a new location. Notice here that we're working with Pose2D. It's just a class that has a translation 2D and rotation 2D, which has the actual x, y, and theta coordinates of the robot. Now, back in robotcontainer.java, we can generate our trajectory for our robot to follow. Since we're programming for the autonomous mode, let's go into the get autonomous command function. First, let's create a trajectory config object to specify how fast we want the robot to drive. It also needs the kinematics of the chassis. Next, we can define the path we want to drive. With the WPI library, we can just define some intermediate points and it will automatically generate a smooth path for us. To do that in the code, we will use the trajectory generator, give it the initial point, some more points to go through, a final point, and the trajectory configuration. For this video, we won't create a complicated motion profile for the robot heading. Instead, we'll just tell it to spin 180 degrees by the time it finishes. Then, we will create the PID controllers to correct for the errors in the trajectory. For theta, we are using a profiled PID controller, which is just a PID controller with a limit on its maximum speed and acceleration. This way, the robot will rotate very slowly over the course of its trajectory. Since the robot heading is between negative and positive 180 degrees, we will make this PID controller continuous to handle that. Next, we need a command to autonomously drive this robot. Fortunately, the WPI library has already provided one to us. So now, we just need to pass in the trajectory, a function to get the robot coordinates, the chassis kinematics, the three PID controllers, a function to set the sort of module states, and finally, a subsystem to require. And if we look at the implementation of this command, it's exactly what we expect. In execute, it obtains the trajectory speeds for the current time. Then, it combines that with the PID output to calculate the desired chassis speed. Finally, it converts that into swerve module commands and assigns them to the motors. Back in robotcontainer.java, the last thing we need to do is to return this command. However, we want to do some initialization by resetting the odometer before it starts and stopping the robot after it finishes. So we'll create a couple instant commands and put them in a sequential command group. By resetting the odometer like this, even if the robot does not start on the initial point on our trajectory, it will move that trajectory to the robot's current location. And congratulations! That is it for the code. Now let's see if it works. One. I hope you've enjoyed this video of Zero to Autonomous. Hit that like button if you learned something new, and until next time, happy coding!